Winter Quarter, Faith That Pleases God, Unit 1, Profiles in Faith. Our lesson today is entitled, The Faith of Elizabeth and Mary. And we're coming from Luke chapter 1, verses 36 through 45 and 56. And this is from the New American Standard Bible version. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called infertile is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the Lord's bondservant, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now at this time, Mary set out and went into, in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Did you know that Mary's rush to see Elizabeth should be read in the context of Luke chapter 1 verse 36 as Mary's excitement born of her confidence in the angel's message that she and Elizabeth would both be experiencing miraculous births and in sharing their experiences could affirm and support each other's faith over the months of pregnancy. That John the Baptist recognized Jesus in utero and his mother Elizabeth accepted his joyful identification with a confidence that allowed her to enter into Mary's joy completely. It is a testament to the appropriately harnessed power of community in that the experience of sharing this confidence in God produced overwhelming joy and even greater faith because of its mutual affirmation. That Elizabeth's greeting contains two blessings, Luke chapter 1 verse 42 following the Old Testament model in which the second blessing is understood to cause the first blessing that you find in Genesis chapter 14, verses 19 and 20, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 14, and Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. That Elizabeth affirmed Mary's response of faith as further reason for joy especially in light of Zachariah's skepticism, even when faced with an angel that you found in Luke chapter 1, verse 20. Elizabeth's reaction demonstrates that confident faith in response to God's calling results in no regrets in our obedience. Elizabeth's greeting is significant on multiple levels. It is clearly a prophetic announcement. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 41, compared with Luke chapter 1, verse 42, and John chapter 1, verse 15, both in the blessings and in her confident identification of Jesus' identity, as you find in Luke chapter 1, verses 42 through 45 but it also fulfills the angel's promise of indwelling spoken 
to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, as well as introducing the role of the Holy Spirit, which is critical in the books of Luke and Acts in empowering God's people in faith. That there is no doubt that Elizabeth's description of Jesus as my Lord was meant to affirm his divine nature. You can compare that with Luke chapter 1, verse 76, chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 3, verse 4, chapter 6, verse 5, chapter 20, verses 42 through 44, and Acts chapter 2, verse 36. It is a shockingly bold statement of faith shared by these mothers this early in Jesus' incarnation. Our biblical, historical, geographical, and cultural background. The birth announcement by the angel Gabriel to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 35, parallels the announcement he made to Zechariah in the previous episode, in our previous lesson. Luke intended for Jesus and John to be compared in these two announcements and for the reader to see that Jesus was demonstrably greater than John. The two announcements therefore serve a Christological purpose. Given the advanced age of Elizabeth, John's conception was remarkable, but Jesus's conception through the creative power of the Holy Spirit was miraculous. The angel announced to Zechariah that John's role would be to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You can find that in chapter 1, verse 17. The announcement to Mary revealed that John would prepare the way for Jesus, who is the Son of the Most High, and embodies the Lord in his mission and person. John's significance in God's great plan was tied solely to his connection to Jesus. And I've given you the reference. The two birth announcements from the angel also marked a paradoxical downward trend. The scene shifts from the first announcement in the temple, which you'll find in chapter 1, verse 11, to a non-temple setting in Nazareth, which you find in verse 26, from the holy city to a village of no consequence. The prestige of the character whom the angel visited shifts from an elderly man with high status, Zacharias, to a young female with no status, Mary. The contrast in the two births, birth announcements indicate that the reign of God will turn everything topsy-turvy. Everything will be upside down. Two different settings with two different women brought into service by Almighty God to redeem humankind. One woman advanced in years, the other just entering her teens but both play their parts in the unfolding purposes of God that eventually led to the Son of God's being born in a manger and acclaimed by shepherds. Mary's epiphany opens with the appearance of the angel Gabriel in verse 26. Little is said about Gabriel in the Bible. He appears in scripture only here and in Daniel, um, Daniel chapter 8, verse 16, and chapter 9, verse 21. But he is often mentioned in the non-biblical literature of the intertestamental period. There, Gabriel is identified as one of the seven archangels of Jewish tradition. The angel's appearance to Mary is Luke's second annunciation type scene. 
You find that in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. What is understood in this narrative about the social cultural background of Mary and Elizabeth is the stories of barrenness that occurred at pivotal points in the story of Israel. Barrenness rep, uh, repeatedly threatened the promise of fertility in Israel's story, and God's intervention continually preserved the lineage. And I've given you the reference. Although Mary was not barren, her virginity, like Elizabeth's barrenness, points to the implausibility of conception. In each case, God intervened to reverse these women's childlessness and preserve the redemptive work of God made manifest in Jesus Christ. The angel who appeared unto Mary said it best, for nothing will be impossible with God. You'll find that in Luke chapter 1 verse 37. What great faith it took for Mary to say yes to God. The birth of Jesus, like the birth of John, was announced by the angel Gabriel, who began with this greeting. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. You find it in verse 28. It is doubtful whether Gabriel could have found anywhere in Israel a more unlikely person than Mary to greet. She was among the lowly of the low. She was young, possibly as young as 12 or 13, in that very awkward stage between childhood and womanhood. Like many others in Israel, Murray was a poor, uneducated peasant living in a small country town far from the center of power. She was also a female in a culture that discounted women. From a merely human perspective, she was insignificant. One writer referred to her as a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. And I've given you the reference. Mary responded to the angelic announcement with great faith and what a difference it made in her life. Her encounter with the angel ended with her great confessions. Let it be to me according to your word, verse 38b. Mary had the confident assurance that God was with her, that she was indeed a co-partner in God's eternal scheme of redemption. Unlike Zacharias, Mary's meeting an angel did not leave her speechless in verse 20. On the contrary, she readily confessed her faith and accepted God's call. It is rare to find someone willing to trust God for the impossible and obey him without hesitation or qualification. Mary offered God her humble, trusting, submissive obedience. At the angel's announcement, she was committed to doing whatever she was told to do as the servant of God. Luke began the announcements of John's and Jesus' births with an important timestamp. In the days of King Herod of Judea, you find in verse 5, which gives some indication of the religious, social, and political tensions in the Jewish world at the time of John's and Jesus' birth. Under Roman rule, a yearning for God's salvation and the anticipation of the promised Messiah continued to percolate in the Jewish collective consciousness. Finally, Luke announced the inbreaking activity of God to save his people. It came in the form of a theophany, which is an appearance by God, while Zechariah, a priest, offered a sacrifice in the temple. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous before God and lived blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. That's in verse 6a. However, Elizabeth had been unable to bear children. 
and both she and Zechariah were now old and beyond childbearing years. You find that in verse 7 and 18. In the biblical world, barrenness was viewed as a curse from God. On a day when Zacharias was, Zachariah was serving in the temple, an angel told him that he, his prayer had been, had been heard and that Elizabeth would bear him a son named John, which means God has been gracious. And I've given you the reference. The movement and mission of God Almighty continued when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary six months later, not in the temple, the holy place of Jerusalem, but rather in the nondescript village of Nazareth. He announced that she would be with a child born of the Holy Spirit. The sharp contrast in status from the holiness of the temple to the simplicity of a village abode and from a respected male priest to a lowly female teenager continued the theme of reversal throughout the entire announce, Annunciation narrative. One child, John, would be born of a man. The other, Jesus, would be born through the creative act of the Holy Spirit. The virgin birth is essential to the Christian faith because Jesus Christ, God's son, had to be free from the sinful nature passed on to all other human beings by Adam. Because Jesus was born of a woman, he was a human being. But as the Son of God, Jesus was born without any trace of human sin. Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. Because Jesus lived as a man, human beings know that he fully understands their experiences and struggles because he is God. He has the power and authority to deliver people from their sins. Jesus and John were two children born of two women with two distinct purposes in God's divine plan for our salvation. And I've given you the reference. Our lesson explained. Only Luke intertwines the lives of John and Jesus by making Mary and Elizabeth relatives. Verse 36, this detail creates the occasion for the subsequent encounter of the two mothers-to-be in which John would begin to play his prophetic role. With the announcement of the birth of Jesus and the pregnancy of her relative Elizabeth, Mary was reminded by the angel that God accomplishes what seems impossible to human beings. That's in verse 37. Mary responded to the angel by assenting to the promise she had heard and the role it had for her. That's in verse 38. Mary's life provides an authentic model of trust and obedience in response to God's initiative, anticipating her later role among the disciples of Jesus. Luke 1 verses 39 and 40 is commonly referred to as the visitation. It depicts Mary's hasty trip, hasty trip from Nazareth to Galilee to the Judean hills, verse 39, to the home of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Luke mentions no traveling companion for the 80 miles or so, no means of travel, foot, donkey, cart, etc., and rest stops along the way. His focus is entirely on Mary and the lack of denial hints at her independence and resourcefulness. Upon entering the house of Zachariah, Mary greeted Elizabeth. 
The focus is on two pregnant Jewish women. Elizabeth yielded to Mary's more gracious role, more glorious role, just as John yielded to Jesus. In the unfolding plan of God, two women were uniquely touched by God and called into his service, a senior citizen and a teenager. Elderly Baron Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant, stayed at home to rest while she waited for the birth of John. The young virgin Mary, who had just become aware of her pregnancy, took to the road to travel to see her cousin after the angel informed her that Elizabeth was pregnant. The women rejoiced to share their good news and discuss what God had done among themselves. When Mary arrived at the home of Elizabeth and greeted her, Elizabeth had an ecstatic experience in which she was filled with the Holy Spirit. This infilling accomplished Gabriel's prophecy in chapter 1, verse 15, that John, a lifelong Nazarite, would be filled with the Holy Spirit before his birth. The physical presence of Mary caused the unborn infant to leap in Mary's womb. Verse 41. Elizabeth interpreted that babe's leaping in her womb at the sound of Mary's voice as a leap for joy. Elizabeth was the first to recognize the advent of the Holy Child, referring to Mary as blessed among women and the mother of my Lord. Verse 42. This shows the priority of Jesus in the infancy of narrative. He is the one who caused rejoicing in Elizabeth's womb. Both women experienced this advent with an intense physical and spiritual intimacy that Zachariah and Joseph could not know. These women and their great demonstration of faith are at the center of Luke's drama as holy vessels through whom God fulfilled his purpose. They had shown themselves to be people of faith who lived out the prophetic power of the angel's announcement. The most important thing Elizabeth said was not about Mary, but rather about Jesus. She referred to the child in Mary's womb as her Lord. This could have been revealed to Elizabeth only by the Holy Spirit. In response to Elizabeth's generous welcome, Mary's praise of God demonstrates verses 39 through 56. When told by the angel of Elizabeth's pregnancy, she hurried to the village to greet her relative. Once she greeted Elizabeth, she took time to reflect on the meaning of these events for God's people, so the story's pace slows a bit. She came to Elizabeth's home in haste, but now she lingered, remaining with her older relative for about three months before returning home. We have no word about what happened during that period or why Mary left when she did. Some concluding thoughts and reflections. We need people with whom we can share our joys and struggles in life. To whom do we turn when we need to process major life events? Just as Mary found a kindred spirit in her relationship with Elizabeth, so also can we find spiritual encouragement and support from those who share our faith in God. Two women at very different places in their lives, responded to God's initiative and faith and became a blessing, not just to their people, but to the whole of humankind as well. Mary, who hurried to a small town to greet her relative Elizabeth, 
once the angel revealed to her that Elizabeth was pregnant, held no official position among her people. Unlike Zechariah, she is not described as righteous in observing the Torah, and her experience with the angel Gabriel did not occur in the hallowed walls of the temple. She was among the most powerless people in her society. She was young in a culture that values age, female in a world ruled by men, and poor in a world divided by class. Furthermore, she had neither husband nor child to validate her existence, yet she had found favor in God. She dedicated her young life to the service of God, and God did great things through this young woman. Her very name, Miriam, means excellence. Jesus' family tree, Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. You'll notice 14 generations, 14 generations, Abraham to King David, 14 generations, King David to exile in Babylon, 14 generations, exile in Babylon to Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the example of Mary's trusting belief. Show us how Mary's example can inform our own faith. Help us move ever more toward faith, toward belief and faith. Thank you for the encouragement of your faithful people of the past as recorded in your word. Heavenly Father, give us the faith to trust you enough to open our lives to you. Do to us what you must do, must so that you can do through us what you will. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Faith with obedience leads to great joy.